This is uh, Deo Democracy in Europe's online debate, See You in Court, Rule of Law, Conditionality, the Case of Hungary. I'm Vibe Thermansen and I'll be the moderator today. Uh, we have to, today uh, participants from 13 European countries and from the US. So I think it is safe to say that is, this is a European matter and that there really truly are Europeans, people living in, in the EU who, are, who takes a deep interest in this. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, have a great debate and discussion with all of you. But before I say anything more, my colleague Tina Menzel would like to, to clear up the technical issues. Yes, thank you, Vibe. Um, as some of you might already have noticed, I will, uh, I will mute your sound during the presentation so we avoid uh, background noise. Um, but it doesn't matter, uh, mean that you can't have the word uh, because we open up for questions after the presentations and during the meeting you can also send me a, a message if you have uh, any questions. Um, and then I will put it on my list. I have a list uh, next to me where I will put your name on so I can, uh, so I can, uh, and then I will say when it's your turn to, to ask the question. And to, uh, if you have a question, you, uh, if you're sitting, sitting next to a computer, you have to go to the bar below at the computer and there, uh, there you can uh, see different functions and there's a function called chat. And if you open that, you can write uh, to me, Tina Menzi. Um, and if you're sitting next to an iPad, then it is in the right upper corner where you can uh, see three dots and there you have to choose chat to write a question to me. And if you don't have a microphone in your computer, a phone or iPad, then just let me know and then I can ask the question for you. And since I, I can see that uh, many of you have your cameras on and it's really nice because it's, because it's nice when we uh, debate and uh, that we can see each other. Uh, so for those of you who don't have your camera on, it would be nice if you will turn it on, but it's also just okay if you, if you don't want to. And then in the, in the right corner, you can see two options, a speaker view and gallery view. And if you click on speaker view, you can see a big picture of the person who is talking. And uh, if you have it on speaker view right now, you can see a big picture of me. Uh, and then if you click on gallery view, then you can see a lot of uh, small pictures of all the participants in this meeting. And if you're sitting in next to an iPad, then it, it's in the left side uh, of the iPad. And then lastly, I will uh, let you know that I will record the meeting and then I'll put it on our YouTube channel uh, because in that way everyone can see it afterwards, also the people who have been prevented to participate in this meeting. Yes, thank you, Vivi. Thank you, Tina. Um, we have uh, democratic issues in a, a lot of countries in, in the European Union, but a very long list of institutions has established that in, it's especially in Poland and Hungary, we have huge grave problems. We have a democracy crisis in these two countries. And how is that since both Poland and Hungary are members of the European Union? And in order to join the European Union, you have to fulfill the Copenhagen criteria, a long list of, of things that you have to fulfill um, before you can be a member. And these criteria will in short, it's about democracy, rule of law, human rights. So they did actually fulfill this criteria. They became members of the European Union. So how is this happening now? Why is this happening now? Well, these um, uh, we, we do still have these values, these European values in, in the EU. We have them in the, in the European, um, uh, in, in the treaty. And I'll just share my screen here. It's, it's in the article two of the treaty and, and I just, uh, I'll try to read aloud. The union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. So it's there, it's in the treaty. We do have these European values still. So how can this happen? Well, once you're in 
Once you're in the European Union, you can't get kicked out. It's not in the treaty. There's only one way of leaving uh, the European Union, and that is voluntarily, if you want to leave the treaty, it's if you want to leave the Union. It's called Article 50. And you can go ask in the UK how smooth that procedure is. That is the only way of leaving the European Union. In the treaty, we do have another article, Article 7, uh, and it's, well, in short, it's about you could lose the right to vote in the council um, if, if you don't obey to these rules in Article 2. But it doesn't seem to, to work, this Article 7. So the Commission and, and other um, parties has it's tried to, to use to, to uh, sue member states at the European Court of Justice. And that seems to work, but only in very specific cases. So what to do then? Well, that is what the European Union are wondering these years. And they came up with the idea of a rule of law conditionality or rule of law mechanism. And it was actually and finally agreed at the summit in December 2020. It means, it says that the EU, well, it links well, you have to obey the, the rules, um, the European values, the rule of law and democracy in order to have funds from the European Union. But it says that the EU budget payments can be withheld from countries in which established, established breaches of the rule of law compromise management of the EU funds. Well, that means that you have to agree that there is a breach of rule of law and you have to prove that, that this breach of the rule of law actually compromise the management of the EU funds, that you could cheat with EU money because of this, uh, of, of breaking uh, the rule of law. The Commission, the European Commission was obliged to, to implement this reg reg regulation from 1st of January 2021. And I remind you that today is April the 20th. But uh, well, they didn't do so. I, I, well, it's a spoiler, but they didn't do. So why, why didn't they do that? Well, the Council asked the European Commission to refrain from in implementing the mechanism while a member country challenges its legality at the Court of Justice of the European Union. And that is exactly what happened. Poland and Hungary took this rule of law conditionality to the European Court of Justice. Now it's there and everything is, is at a halt. So that was just a very brief introduction. To, to take us deeper into these matters, I invited Daniel Hegedus. Welcome, Daniel. You are a Central European Fellow at the German Marshall Fund in Berlin. You're an expert in populism and democratic backsliding in Central and Eastern Europe. You have been researching and you have been teaching at universities in Berlin and Budapest. You have worked for Freedom House and German Council on Foreign Relations and so on and so on. And you are Hungarian. You do actually read Hungarian newspapers. And Hungarian is, well, Kathleen, you do it as well, but it is a scarcely accessible language for most of the Europeans. But you do actually read Hungarian newspapers. And since a lot of Hungarian newspapers present the Hungarian government's view, I'd like to ask you, what is the Hungarian gov government's position? Why, why is this so important for them? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Weber. Thank you for the kind introduction and for having me in, in, this, in this great panel. Um, believe me, um, reading Hungarian government-friendly newspapers is definitely not a, not a huge fun, but we can somehow perceive it as a sort of, uh, of challenge. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's pretty simple to, to understand the Hungarian and the Polish government's approach uh, to, to the rule of law conditionality regulation their cost benefits calculations and uh, and why they they block this this legislative uh, proposal and i think in in this regard probably it's more important to take a look on on the facts and not necessarily on on the narrative of these two governments but also touching briefly upon this issue um, um, there is a general communication strategy used both by the polish and the hungarian governments what we could translate as whataboutism meaning that they relativize uh, generally the content and the importance of, of rule of law. They question that uh, uh, a generally binding concept of rule of law exists, that 
this is laid down in the EU's legal framework and that can be used uh, in connection with, uh, uh, with uh, the rule of law conditionality and the redistribution of, of the European funds. And practically that position is also in the background why they challenge the legality of the adopted rule of law conditionality regulation in a so-called action for annulment procedure uh, in front of, uh, of the Court of Justice. But, uh, but to understand why they really do that, uh, I think we could just simply take a look on the one hand uh, on the question how Poland and Hungary really benefit from, uh, from the European budget and the redistribution of the European funds, and what is really the rule of law situation in, uh, in these countries. Uh, practically, both Hungary and Poland are the largest beneficiaries of the EU financial transfers. Poland in absolute terms and Hungary on a, on a per capita basis. Uh, and there for also their exposure to the conditionality regulation is really high. They are the most obvious candidates to be sanctioned under the new mechanism. You could ask why. Uh, the regulation explicitly refers to three cases which definitely constitute a breach of the rule of law principle and in which cases the sanction mechanism should be triggered by the European Commission. And these three cases are first, the endangering of the independence of the judiciary. This is a condition which is obviously fulfilled by Poland, but most likely also fulfilled by Hungary. Second, failing to prevent, correct, or sanction the arbitrary decisions of the public authorities made with regard to the redistribution of the EU funds. This is a condition which is obviously fulfilled by Hungary. And third, there is the limiting the access to legal remedy. And this is a condition which is again both fulfilled by, by Poland and Hungary. Poland has since 2016 uh, an ongoing conflict with the European institutions due to the fact what we could describe as a deli deliberate onslaught on the independence of the Polish judiciary. And uh, in Hungary, on the other hand, the abuse of the EU funds take place in the frames of a state-organized centralized corruption machinery in which the passivity of the Hungarian public prosecutor is per se politically guaranteed. Um, political corruption in Hungary is not prosecuted. According to, to the European Anti-Fraud Agency, uh, Olaf, the share of irregularities involving EU funds is approximately 10 times higher in Hungary than the EU average, and eight times higher than in the case of the second ranking country, which, uh, which is Slovakia. Hungary is the only member state of the European Union where Olaf alone identified more irregularities than all of the national uh, prosecution agencies in the country. And against that background, it is easy to understand why Budapest and uh, Warsaw opposed the rule of law conditionality regulation, because due to the rule of law situation in Poland and, uh, and due to the uh, high corruption level in, in Hungary, these two countries obviously fulfill the conditions laid down in this regulation. Meanwhile, both countries are highly dependent from the redistribution of EU funds. Thanks a lot, Daniel. I, I'm sure we'll get back to you later. Uh, when we open for comments and, and questions, you are very welcome to ask Daniel more as well. Thank you, Daniel. But for now, I, I'd like to welcome as well Katalin Chair, another Hungarian. Um, you're Vice Chair of Renew Europe Group in the European Parliament and you're co-founder of the Hungarian party called Momentum, um, which started by a campaign against the Hungarian government's decision to bid for the Summer Olympics in 2024. And you actually succeeded. And since that, I think it is fair to say that you have been well, in the hairs of, of the Hungarian government. And I would also like, to, thanks a lot for joining us, Kathleen. And I would also like to, to welcome your colleague in the European Parliament in the Renew Europe Group, uh, Morten Helvi Petersen. You have been a member of the uh, European Parliament th since 2014, 14. <laughs> 
And before that, you were a member of the of the parliament in Denmark um, for for radical venstre. It's well, literally in English, it's radical left, but I think it's fair to say it's more like absolute center, perhaps of Danish politics uh, at least. In in the European Parliament, you're a member of Renew Europe, and you're substitute at the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice, and Home Affairs, which have been dealing intensively with these matters for, for years and years. So I'd like to start to ask you, uh, Morten, well, we heard that, that the committee is supposed to be the guardian of the treaty. Is it still so? And if not, well, it didn't, it didn't start implementing the rule of law mechanism. So, well, well let's start by this. Is, is it still a guardian of the treaty? Uh, I, I assume you, you're referring to the Commission being a guardian of, of, of the treaty. And, and, um, but, but let me just uh, take one step back prior to, to, to answering the question and saying that uh, this mechanism is, is really a breakthrough. Uh, considering and, and, and given that we haven't had such a mechanism in, in all these years. And, and, and I think you can wonder why. I mean, how come we have all these uh, uh, strict uh, accession criteria, the Copenhagen criteria, and, and, and all these basic values for applicant countries to the European Union to fulfill, uh, and without having any sort of enforcement mechanisms subsequently in case of violations of, of some of these uh, fundamental principles. And, and, and uh, even though this mechanism that, that we've introduced by now is, is by no means perfect, I consider this to be a very, very important first step that, that we succeed. And, and this is uh, not least due to all the hard work done by, by Kathleen and, and, and uh, the good people in, in, uh, in Renew uh, that, that we actually came through with this mechanism. And I, I think it's, it's a very important point to say and stress that the European Council and the Commission more or less agreed on budget prior to the European Parliament coming in and negotiating through this mechanism. So I, I take pride in this. I think it's, it's, it's really a breakthrough. It, again, it's by no means perfect, but now we have something to work with. Now, trying to answer your question, and I'll be brief and, uh, and, and wrap this up. Um, we are now critical vis-a-vis -vis the commission for not guarding sufficiently this mechanism. And, and we have uh, encouraged the commission to uh, actually to, to, to take the commission to court in order to ensure that we apply this mechanism now we're having it. So we are critical from uh, the European Parliament side, from the Renew Group side, uh, as to the enforcement of this uh, very important mechanism. Yeah, well, sorry, Morten, of course, congratulations with, with the rule of law mechanism. It is truly an achievement, but we do agree that it's not implemented yet, right? And it should have been implemented from the 1st of January. Exactly. And this is what we are critical uh, about. And we are we're pushing uh, the commission uh, in order to ensure that we apply this mechanism and do it correctly. Absolutely. So, so this is the way pushing the commission. Um, but but is, is the commission still a guardian of the treaty then, if, if it's not implementing it right now? Well, this is exactly our criticism that in order to be guardian of the treaty, you, you would have to implement uh, this mechanism. So, uh, yeah, and yes, it is uh, formally speaking, but if it wants to still to live up to its obligations, it would have to implement this as well. And this is exactly what we're pushing for. Yeah, and, and you, you even gave them a deadline, 1st of June, otherwise you'll take them to court. It says yeah. in the resolution. Catalin, if, if the commission is, is, not, is not implementing this rule of law mechanism now, would you like someone else to, to do something? Would you like the member states to step in? Uh, good afternoon, and uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me on, uh, on this panel. And uh, well, yes, you are touching to the heart of the topic. Uh, indeed, we would like to see this mechanism implemented. We would like to see uh, the founding values of the European Union protected. Uh, that was a huge failure up until now. And I do believe that uh, all, upon the pressure of the European Parliament, the European Commission, we realize uh, its obligations to act and uh, they will respect our deadlines, which is uh, June the 1st. 
However, I do count on also on the member states, on the council, to do everything in their power uh, to get this mechanism running. Because let me just stop here for a second. At your, in, in your introduction, you mentioned that uh, currently this problem is very uh, prominent in Poland and Hungary. But I would add other countries to this list. Look at Bulgaria, uh, look at Slovenia. The illiberal uh, populist disease is spreading like a virus all across Europe. And if other leaders just see that they can go on destroying the rule of law, stealing European money, stuffing up uh, oligarchs uh, in their closed center, destroying free media without any serious European repercussions, then this disease will get anywhere. And every democracy is fragile, even Danish democracy. Uh, I'm, don't be fooled by the notion that it could not happen in your country or anywhere else. If we Europeans do not band together now and put a stop to this uh, very, very um, dangerous process, then the entire integrity of our union is in danger. Therefore, yes, I count on the commission, I count on the member states, but most of all, I count on us, on the European Parliament, who have been drivers of this process since the very beginning. And I'm very proud having worked together with Morten Helbeck ever since day one of this mandate to get the countries in line, to respect the rule of law and protect our European money. And now you're just there, just at the end. Uh, you, you can you can almost see see it done because it it was, it was um, well it was agreed upon, but it's not implemented yet. And now you you had this resolution in the European Parliament that you could take the Commission to court for passivity if they didn't, if they if they don't do anything before first of June. But coming back to Daniel Hegedus, what aboutism? Sorry, but what will happen? The, what, what if they won't do it? Um, what, what will you be prepared to do in the European Parliament, Katalin? Would you be prepared to sack some of the commissioners? Well, Parliament pledged with a huge majority that we are prepared to take the commission to court. Um, the European treaties uh, have a provision called the failure to act. This is basically similar to if you don't do your job at your workplace, you can get fired. Uh, also. Being a commissioner is also a job. If they don't act, work, they can get fired by, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, Parliament elected the commission, and uh, we also have the power to withdraw our mandate. I sincerely hope that this uh, is not what will happen, but rather to pressure them into implementing the uh, regulation to working properly. Because we did not mention, I think, or we did not speak enough about a very important element of this whole picture. The regulation that was agreed between Parliament, Council and Commission, I was one of the negotiators, of course it's far from perfect, but it's quite good. But at the end of the Council uh, in December, basically the uh, deal, what was struck there, is in clear violation of European law. And if the Commission does not act as it laid down in the regulation, it violates the law. We cannot protect, we cannot start protecting the rule of law by violating our own treaty. Uh, and, and Parliament has the duty to protect the law in front of the court if necessary. Mm -hmm. and we are determined to do so. Yeah. Okay, so this is what this resolution means. The resolution about taking the Commission to court for passivity, passivity means in the end that you will be ready to fire commissioners who is not doing their job. Well, if this is what the court decides, then yes. But we are not determined to, you know, get one commission or the other fired. We, we don't have any personal problems with anybody. Uh, no. It's very far from that. I want the law to work. I don't want European governments stealing European taxpayers' money. I want the integrity of our democracy protected. And I hope that, you know, this is the consensus uh, what will uh, happen in Europe and we'll, you know, implement the law as we should. This is my goal, not to, you know, get somebody fired. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Your, your goal is to protect democracy and rule of law. Of course, that, that is the goal, yeah. Um, Morten, about, about the mechanism that, that was agreed upon in, in, in December. Well, it's, it's, about, uh, it's only about um, rule of law and it's about, well, if you can establish that there is a break of rule of law and if you can establish that this uh, break of the rule of law 
will compromise the management of EU funds, then you can implement this mechanism. But is, is it possible anyhow to broaden this mechanism, to, to broaden it on, onto the other uh, points in, in Article 2, the other European values? I know that Helena Daly, the, the commissioner for, um, for equality, she was trying to implement LGBT issues as well in, in this rule of law mechanism in August last year, but she didn't quite succeed. Do, do we, are we stuck with this um, rule of law me mechanism that we have now, or would it be possible to broaden it somehow or sometime? Well, uh, yeah, hopefully sometime in the future, but, but again, coming back to, uh, to uh, I mean, the, the, what, what, what happened uh, this time around was that in, in the light of these lengthy and complex uh, budget negotiations, where, as you know, that there is a seven years uh, budget in, in the EU. And, and in itself, these budget negotiations are, are terrible, difficult and, and, and complex. And, and member states do not want to provide the EU with its own resources or, or do they? And we have the corona and, and you know, all sorts of, of, of difficult uh, technicalities on the table. And, and, and this is every seven years or so that this takes place, these round of negotiations on, on, on budgetary issues. And in that context, being able to uh, get this breakthrough, which I truly consider this to be, that for the first time in the history of the union, we have a rule of law mechanism. Again, it's by no means perfect, but we are now introducing this notion, this concept, this basic idea of ensuring a correlation between upholding uh, rule of law and then the disbursement of funds. And this is really a breakthrough. And this was not ha happening. This would not have happened if not for, for, for the European Parliament. So uh, I think it would be a stretch too far saying that we can revise this next year and introduce even broader scope. Personally, I would be happy to see it. But I, I just have to acknowledge that this was really a tough fight and we would not have had anything like this on the table if it had not been for the pressure coming from uh, from European Parliament. I, I think you're right in, in the pressure from the European Parliament. C Catalin, well, about this, well, the rule of law uh, mechanism, um, well, you're pushing for it, but it's not implemented yet. And not, when it's not implemented, it's because of, of an agreement between the, the heads of states from December that it was that the commission should not implement it until member states had, had had the opportunity to take it to, to the European Court of Justice, which Poland and Hungary did. And lo a lot of critics say that it was only to buy, to make, to give Orban the, the possibility of buying time before the election, the parliamentary election in, in Hungary, which is coming up next spring. And often uh, cases at the European Court of Justice are very lengthy. So maybe he could just buy time until, until he has got his next uh, election. Is this what is happening? Is, is Orban just buying time? Well, sure. Hungarian voters go to the polls next April, exactly a year from now. And uh, Mr. Orban sees that his liberal house is on fire. Uh, two years ago at the local elections, the opposition scored a decisive victory. And right now in the polls, the United Opposition leads compared to Fidesz with a few points that hasn't happened in many, many years. So, you know, he's in trouble. And Congratulations. Well, I keep my fingers crossed for so far, but we have a very long road ahead of us. But, but yes, you know, he also feels that he is in trouble. And the last thing he wants uh, is uh, an other cafe where when Hungarian voters lose their money because of his illiberal practices. So he does everything in his power to drag things on, to veto, to blackmail, to go to court. But I, I'm very positive that it won't be successful. You mentioned that, uh, of course, many court cases can take very long. Uh, for this prime example is uh, the case on the Central European University, which was closed only recently, and now, well, the entire university is in Vienna. So, of course, there's a precedent for this. But uh, compared uh, to what Mr. Orman says in the press, President von der Leyen stated in the European Parliament that uh, she expects the whole procedure to go through in four or five months, right? Uh, so, 
So there is a possibility for a quick procedure. And if it does not happen, the parliament pledged in an earlier resolution that was initiated by our group renew that we will ask for an expedited procedure. So parliament will not let the court sit on this case for long because European voters deserve their money to be protected. And by the way, I have to reiterate that I believe that this is a breach of law uh, if the commission uh, holds uh, its uh, actions until the court case is closed, because the according to the European Union's law, the Council cannot instruct the Commission. These are independent bodies. Uh, they just they they can you know, make a recommendation that maybe you should not do that, but they cannot instruct the Commission. And uh, if the Commission obeys this order, then as I said before, Parliament will take the Commission to court. Hmm. Yeah, because. The European Parliament can make laws and the Commission can make laws, but the Council can't. Well, you know, I can ask you, for instance, that could you please walk my dogs? But I cannot instruct you to come to Hungary and walk my dogs. These are, this is, I'm sorry for this parallel, but this is the same thing. Uh, the, the Council may recommend to the Commission that maybe you should consider waiting until the court case is closed, but they don't have to. Yeah. Okay, anytime, Kathleen, by the way, anytime with these dogs. I have very cute dogs. <laughs> the, the floor is open. You're very welcome to, to ask any kind of questions, comments, uh, whatever. Just write in the chat for Tina Menzel and you, you will be able to ask your, ask your questions directly to, to Morten Helvi, Kathleen Che, or, or Daniel Hegedus. But while, while, while we're waiting, while you're tapping uh, in, in the chat, I'd like to ask you, Daniel, do you have any idea how long will this take at the European Court of Justice? Um, not normally, uh, as Kathleen already mentioned, uh, a normal procedure can take two or three years long. Uh, I think it's still optimistic to expect a result, even in the case of an expedited procedure that the Court of Justice will rule or, or provide a ruling uh, for the, the autumn months, meaning that as Kathleen mentioned, uh, the Hungarian government indeed won a, consider a considerable amount of time before uh, the 2022 elections. However, if you allow me just to uh, touch upon a, a further issue, and that is the, uh, the, lit the European Parliament's potential litigation with the European Commission. And uh, according to the information what we hear from the Commission, uh, the Commission is not necessarily impressed by these that posture, meaning that they will not start implementing uh, the regulation with the 1st of June, and they simply call the bluff of the European Parliament. Why? Because they know that the legal reasons aside of the European Parliament are not necessarily very strong. The problem is not that uh, the December compromise in the European Council didn't violate the, Euro, uh, the rule of law at European level. It did. Uh, as you mentioned, the European Council is not a legislative organ, so it cannot touch upon the content of an already agreed uh, regulation. And it also cannot instruct the European Commission, although we could long discuss from a legal perspective on that whether this was an instruction. Because Ursula von der Leyen joined with her signature uh, to this conclusion, meaning that, of course, the, the president of the European Commission uh, actively assisted undermining the independence of the European Commission. But the problem is that concerning her role as the guardian of the treaties, the European Commission has a very high level of margin of discretion, meaning that they can very freely decide how they approach the violation of European law and European values. It, this, this is an established case law at the level of the Court of Justice, meaning that it's very difficult to shoe the Commission because they failed to act as the guardian of the treaties. Um, and they know that, and they know that they most likely will win. Uh, however, I hope that the European Parliament will still shoe the European Commission because I completely agree with you that uh, the Commission is not anymore an effective guardian of the treaties and it, it simply needs political inputs and also legal inputs uh, from the Parliament and from the member states to simply change her behaviour. And, uh, and if we take a look what can happen if the Parliament's 
lose the case, then the answer is nothing will happen. The current case law will be reinforced once again. But what happens if the European Parliament wins the case? Uh, in that case, the whole case law and the political setup will be changed in favor of a stronger protection of, of the rule of law. And we will have strict limits how the European Commission can, uh, can live with its freedom by exercising its, its duty as the, as the guardian of the treaties. And that would be great because I think one of the biggest uh, problem we have currently uh, in the European Union is that simply the Commission has a too big freedom in this regard, and that opens space for, for political influence, as we have seen during the past one decade, in the case of Hungary, when the European People's Party protected uh, the country also within the European Commission, and now how the Commission could be politically influenced during the December EUCO uh, European Council meeting by the heads of states of governments. So it would be great if losing or winning court cases wouldn't be fetishized, because it's not the question whether someone wins a case, but whether uh, then the results of this ruling can really make a difference and alter the facts on the ground. The European Commission has won a couple of cases against the Hungarian government, like for example, it was mentioned in the case of the Central European University. It did not alter the realities on, uh, in Hungary. So we need cases which make a difference. Thank, thank you. And Morten or Kathleen, I think you should have the right to reply on this. Any, any one of you? Yes. Yeah, I or Morten. Would you like to reply? So no, no risk in. Uh, so go on, uh, sue the Commission. There's no risk, uh, but lots of uh, lots of winning if you potential win. Well, yeah, I mean, I do respect the Commission's opinion that they don't take uh, this seriously. Uh, they have underestimated this Parliament many times. Uh, I believe this is up for the court to decide uh, whether our uh, facts are well-based or not. I can only hope that uh, the action of the commission will happen, uh, maybe not because they are uh, scared of the parliament. Uh, I would rather think that they should act because of their obligation to do so, uh, because of the treaty they sworn to protect and uh, they don't have to like the parliament, they don't have to like the council, they don't have to like their job, but they have to do their job. This is why they are there, this is why they are paid and parliament will do everything in a, its power to remind the commission to uphold the law, protect the rule of law and protect European money from thieves, oligarchs and uh, dictators at the east flank. Yeah, if they don't do their job. Thank you, Kathleen. We, we have a question, Tina. Yeah, we got a question from Christian Nørgaard. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for a very, very good uh, presentations of these uh, delicate uh, matters. Uh, my question is probably to, possible to Daniel, but uh, also Kathleen or Morten. Are the signs of other EU member states being attempted to follow the paths of Poland and Hungary, or is it the impression that the new mechanism, audio not yet implemented, has halted or cooled down such attempts? Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Daniel, Kathleen already mentioned some member states, but please, Daniel. Uh, thank you so much for, for the question. Uh, I, I think, yes, uh, it can have a discouraging effect on further illiberal tendencies in, in Central and Eastern Europe. But I think we also uh, cannot forget that this is not the only tool in the hands of the European Commission. So, for example, concerning uh, those uh, issues which were mentioned, for example, um, the discrimination of, of sexual minorities in Poland, uh, classical infringement procedures may be perhaps uh, better tools in the in the hands of the European Commission. The rule of law conditionality regulation was designed uh, to fill uh, a gap in the toolkit of the European Commission because the systemic deficiencies of the rule of law uh, couldn't be addressed before uh, in, in such a straightforward way that what is possible now with this new tool. But uh, uh, 
but the opportunity to address individual violations of the European law, like, for example, the legal discrimination against sexual minorities, it is a simply pretty, pretty straightforward issue uh, with, with infringement procedures. Morten, would you like to... Thank you, Daniel. Morten, would you like thank to... You. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, but but uh, if, I, if I may just go back to, to uh, the previous uh, line of, of uh, round of comments uh, and, and just making the point that, that Kathleen also made, uh, that, that I mean, we are in the midst of an uh, a institutional battle uh, in, in Brussels uh, between Council Commission and, and, and Parliament on this. And, and we do this in, I would say, all areas, but a lot of areas. But, but this is especially difficult uh, in this rule of law field, given that this is unprecedented what we have introduced here. And I just want to make the basic point that that look at it from the, the alternative perspective. If, if parliament wasn't doing anything, we would have the same old system. There would have been no progress on this. Again, this is by no means perfect. And, and the commission will, and, and, and council also, uh, will, will be very fed up with European parliament, exactly because we insist as, as Kathleen does uh, every day in, in her great uh, work. So just this to say that this is a fight going on and, 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 and we are hopefully winning on, on uh, European parliament side, at least that's what we're aiming for. Now on the question, on the good question on whether we see a, a other countries uh, following suit, I think there is, uh, there is a reason to worry about say, uh, media developments in, in Slovakia, for that matter, say, uh, developments in Bulgaria in terms of, of the political scene, the political parties and, and, and corruption. Uh, we've seen this terrible uh, Maltese uh, case as well. So, yes, we see uh, examples all over Europe uh, on, 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 on backsliding on, on some of these rule of law issues and questions. So uh, this is just all the more reason that it is so bloody important to get this mechanism right, to have it introduced in the first place and to ensure uh, that we get the commission to uh, uphold it. So yes, I, I, I think generally speaking, these years and, 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 and times uh, we, we really have to focus hard on the rule of law issues because we see worrying examples not only in Poland, Hungary, but, but unfortunately also in, in, in other countries. Thanks. Slovenia and Spain and a long, long list of countries. Yeah. And so you have this battle in, in the European Union uh, between, between the institu institutions, but you have these battles inside these countries as well, in, in Poland and in Hungary, especially, and all the other states as well. But while you were discussing, um, while the, the commission was discussing uh, th this spring in Poland, they actually they actually fired just just uh, last week the the ombudsman and and almost abandoned the ombudsman institution in in Poland. So and in in Hungary, Viktor Orban is is hoping for the for the election uh, next year. So time is very important. Time is very important. Uh, it's important for you in the European Union, it's important for the Commission, for the Council, for the Parliament, but it's also very important for these governments in these countries, and they do not just wait, wait to see what will be the outcome of this, of this battle in, in the European Union. Kathleen, that was more common than a question, <laughs> but would you like to comment? Sure. Um, yes, time is at the essence. I do agree with you, and I don't know that from the people who are following us, if either of you are a member or voter of any party that belongs to the EPP family, maybe you could ask your politicians or your party leaders, what took you so long? Uh, because we have been sitting on this illiberal problem pot for more than a decade. And the Fides was a member of the European conservative family while they were destroying media freedom, destroying the independence of judiciary, kicking out the Central European University, and, uh, and you know, nothing happened, no consequence. And now the parliament tries to, you know, fight for a mechanism before it's too late. But let's admit the strategy that the EPP has followed, and sometimes still follows uh, now, 
the appeasement of autocrats is not working. Uh, so we have to draw hard red lines. And just coming back briefly to the previous conversation, I think it's just very interesting to you know, think about that in the EU we have so, so many rules about how member states should behave with their budgets. How big should the deficit be? How much you should spend? And I'm not saying that's wrong, but we just have basically no or very few uh, rules on how you should operate your democracy, whether uh, the freedoms of your people, the independence of your justice, how should it behave and what is the consequence if uh, there are mistakes there? Why is it that we, we, we look at money and we don't look at freedoms? And now we, I think we are paying the cost for always ignoring these issues and regarding them as national competences. Because you Danish taxpayers who are listening to this call, you pay tax a lot. And a part of your tax comes to my country where my current prime minister builds a football stadium next to his home from your money. And I think this should bother you. Uh, this is about democracy. This is why we should have standards. And this is why these standards should be enforced and implemented. But, but it's a very nice football stadium, Kathleen, in Felkshut. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is very nice. Uh, the, uh, I think more people can sit in the stadium compared to how many people live. Yeah, 4,000 in the stadium and 2,000 in the city of Felkshut. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but this is right. This is about our money. This this is about the taxpayers in the European Union. It's it's their money which which, which is actually being misused uh, for political corruption, uh, and and this is what what the rule of law mechanism actually uh, tries to 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 hit. Daniel Daniel Hegedus, uh, Kathleen just mentioned the EPP Fidesz and the EPP group. Could, could you just explain because uh, they try to kick out Fidesz now and and Orban. Uh, well, there was a lot of, of puzzle. Could you could you just explain where are we now? Is Fidesz still in the EPP or? No, Fidesz completely left the European People's Party after a couple of red lines which were disregarded and a couple of, of years during which the European People's Party was really divided on, on the issue of, uh, of Fidesz. I think it must be recognized that it was really a division and there were uh, national delegations and member parties, mostly from the Scandinavian countries and from the Benelux countries and from Poland, which were highly critical uh, towards Fidesz uh, and, uh, and were a group of national delegations, mostly the, from Italy, France, Spain, uh, and most crucially, the German CDU, CSU uh, parties, which protected uh, uh, the Fidesz for various reasons either because uh, they sympathize with this rather radical, conservative, or even illiberal project uh, um, Fidesz promoted, or for geopolitical and economical reason, which was the crucial issue in, in, the, case, uh, in the case of Germany. Uh, so this marriage is now over, and what we see is that Fidesz is, is looking for a new place on the European party landscape. Uh, may that be either joining the European conservatives uh, and reformists, or trying to forge a new radical, line, uh, radical right alliance uh, in the European Parliament. I think it's a rather delicate task. No one succeeded with that until now, and I think we also shouldn't overestimate the capabilities of Prime Minister Orban, but we can remain tuned and we will see whether he succeeds with that uh, or not. But if you allow me just one further phrase, um, on, uh, um, on the other countries in the European Union where we have these illiberal tendencies, it's sure, we have, a, uh, we have rather uh, disencouraging tendencies in, in lots of countries. But I think we don't have anything similar in other member states like what we have in, in Poland and Hungary. It's, it's one thing to have a high level of corruption. It's another thing to, to pursue illiberal media policies. Uh, but such a level of authoritarian tendencies, state capture, and, uh, and the systemical undermining of political competition, what we have in Poland and Hungary, we don't have in any other member state. So it's it's very important to underline the negative tendencies in other countries, but I think it would be a failure to use that examples somehow to relativize uh, the, the deep problems and crisis what we have in these two countries, because that's unique. Uh, 
it's uh, it's it's not uh, an accident that certain democracy measuring projects like Vidam or Freedom House doesn't categorize Hungary anymore as a democracy. So these countries are not illiberal democracies. They don't represent another more or more conservative form of democracies. These countries are autor autocracies in the making. And in the case of Hungary, this development went pretty far. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Morten, as a member of, of the European Parliament, we just touched upon Fidesz, Viktor Orban's uh, party in the European Parliament. What one of its members, the chairman, he became uh, very famous in, in December uh, after a visit to a nightclub. Uh, I think that story was uh, all over Europe. But but Fidesz is, is now lo no, no longer part of the European People's Party, the EPP, the big group. What then? Do, do they get to speak when you have plenary meetings? or? What, what, what? Well, they're, st they're still in Parliament. Yeah, yeah, sure. And and uh, one of the reasons that this has uh, has uh, taken such a long time for for the European People's Party, the, the Conservatives, uh, is is uh, due to the fact that Fidesz has twelve MEPs, twelve members, which is a, a delegation of of a very considerable size, and this has played into uh, the entire power play in Brussels as to distribution of, of, of posts at the very top level and how you divide all the committee chairmanships, et cetera, et cetera, between the political groups. So having 12 people on board within the EPP has, uh, has proven itself to be a very nice to have for the EPP, which is why they've had so much difficulties in, in, in expelling them, uh, which they finally did because, I mean, it just came to a point where you had Fidesz uh, uh, calling the commission all sorts of strange names and uh, behaving really strange and, 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 and bad, in, in my opinion. So there's a lot of rumors uh, going around and speculations on what is going to happen on the right wing, including Fidesz. I mean, wh which kind of groupings from which countries would you see align themselves, perhaps in order to form a new group or, or, or what would you have, uh, say, uh, the uh, the Liga Nord, the Liga from uh, from Italy in there. Would you have, you know, right wing parties from from other countries uh, in there as well? So, so it is going to be a different landscape, and 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 this is uh, important in the context of the European Parliament has a midterm uh, revision or, or 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 has to constitute itself in midterms, which is end of this year, and there you would have a different composition of Parliament different uh, balance of power between the various groups. And, and this is where the big question of the 12 MEPs from Fidesz is, is going to arise. Where, where will they affiliate themselves? Will they create a new group? And what would that uh, imply? So this is still out, uh, out in the open. Yeah, lo lots of rumors I can imagine. There have been meetings as well, Italian, Hungarian meetings and ooh, yeah. So, but we, ha we have some questions, Tina. Yeah, and the first question is from Thomas Tony Nielsen. Yes, hello, thank you. And it has been very interesting so far. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, to which degree does the rule of law conditionality uh, affect the corrupt practices of member states uh, such as Hungary or the Czech Republic, um, as these national governments has a large degree of discretion in regards to how they administer and distribute EU funds such as from the common agricultural policy? Funds. Thank you, Thomas. Kathleen, you, you mentioned my, my money, my the Danish tax, taxpayers' uh, money going going to football stadium in, in Felksud in, in Hungary. Could, could you elaborate? Yes, so... Will it have an effect? Uh, okay, very briefly, there are a lot of ways where European money can go to the wrong places. There is something called irregularities. You make a mistake and then you have to pay something back. Then there is like fraud and crime and all that. For that, we also have different bodies, entities, such as the OLAV, the European Anti-Fraud Body, the newly established European Public Prosecutor's Office, which unfortunately uh, is a voluntary measure or like, I'm sorry, you're Danish. Uh, you are, uh, you are always exempt. But Okay, for instance, I would imagine it would be a good idea to make uh, 
some sort of an obligation towards Hungary and Poland to actually join the European Public Prosecutor's Office. So mid-level fraud and systemic problems could be also investigated by that authority. And what this current mechanism we are talking about is good for is when the rule of law is uh, breached to an extent where European public money is affected. I would believe that uh, in many ways, uh, for instance, the Hungarian operations fall under this category, because this is not only a matter of you know, companies going into the wrong directions because they are mean or corrupted, but there is this entire system that is constructed to funnel European money to the pockets of oligarchs and family members, uh, such as the son-in-law of Mr. Orban. So I, yes, I believe if this mechanism is used correctly, uh, it can have a great effect. We have to use it, but also we have to use the other instruments, the other bodies, and to provide enough funds to other crime-fighting organizations so they can get money back to the bad guys, from the bad guys. Thank you. And one more question, Tina. Yes, we have a question from PSA Jensen. Thank you. Uh, I have a question because Morten talked about battles in the EU. Are the battles a good thing or need the structure in the EU to be changed? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Pia. Morten. That's a good question. Uh, and. and uh, and, and and yes, of, uh, the structures ought to 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 uh, uh, to be changed. Uh, personally, I'm I'm for example, I'm a big fan of of European Parliament of changing the structure in order to make it possible for the European Parliament uh, to come forward with the uh, with proposals for for directives, rather than the Commission having a monopoly on this. Uh, uh, bearing in mind that the European Parliament uh, that that we are directly elected. Uh, members of of, of parliament, uh, as opposed to the commission, where you have uh, the, the the public servants, the good public servants, etc. So, yeah, I think I think we need to change some of the the structures here. But but at the root of this, uh, you you have this eternal uh, fights between the various institutions as to who's doing what and 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 when and and uh, and, and and how. And clearly, on this issue, by the way as well as on climate and, and, and all the green issues, you see a European parliament that is more, in my opinion, progressive and pushing more in terms of being more ambitious than what you would have from council and commission. And I would like to see this reflected in the institutional workings as well, making it possible for the politicians to actually promote and propose uh, directives and, and, and laws. I think we should change the structure uh, according to uh, to this. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Morten. Well, we have to end in very short time, but Daniel, briefly, in, in the end, I'd like to ask you if this rule of law mechanism, this rule of law uh, conditionality, if that is uh, such a good thing, uh, if, if it really it sets out to, to do lots, lots of good things about fraud and about rule of law issues in the European Union, how come that the Hungarian justice minister, Judith Wager, just after it was agreed in December, tweeted victory. Um, because of course that was a domestic political issue for the Hungarian government and uh, they have to declare, declare victory. And in some regard, they, they partially really won. They won time, which was essential for the Hungarian government in the run up to the 2022 elections, as, as we mentioned. And because um, the national freedom fight what is the Hungarian government pursuing on discursive level must always be go on. They simply cannot, they simply cannot lose. Uh, I think it's, it's a general phenomenon at European level that all national governments proclaim that they won. It's an important political resource for them. It happens with, with everyone. And in that case, it happened also with the Polish and the Hungarian government. If we compare that victory to their original intention, then I think they lost because their intention was completely get rid of the, the rule of law condition at the regulation. But if we if we take in look whether the result was useful for them, then yes, it was useful. So they partially really won. And, uh, and I think that is in the background of this strange uh, statement or declaration of Katalin Borga. 
Thank you, Daniel, a true you. academic, this and that. <laughs> and so thank, thanks a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that, that the tweet from Yuri Baka saying, oh, I failed, wouldn't have been the same. <laughs> thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you, Daniel Higgins. Thank you, Morten Helvi Peterson. And thank you, Kathleen Che. And thank you all the rest of uh, the rest of you for joining us today and this very important debate. Good luck with the work and take care. Goodbye.